actually had some water damage too from a flood. Start now. It wasn't about what I wanted, it was about what he wanted. Just go there, the right people are there. I'm not afraid to fail. Am I willing to write in that check? Absolutely. All day long. Yeah, so now I want to get on this because I think people, I'm curious about this too. So um, you went, you moved to New York, you were, in, you were a hairstylist to the stars. Like you just said, uh, rich and famous people aspire to that. Name drop. I want so, your name drop. Okay. <laughs> Who, whose hair have you cut and who have you met and, you know. Sure, sure. So my, the biggest client that was my client uh, was Anderson Cooper. I was his personal hairstylist for six years. Wow, okay. I would go to his house. I would go to the CNN office. He would come to the salon. Uh, just depending on his schedule because it was so crazy, you know, he was always uh, somewhere, Afghanistan, wherever, wherever there was a tragedy, Anderson was he there. He was shooting there. Yeah. Okay, well, what's up? While you're naming it off on him, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Okay. I want to know how much. How much do these guys pay for a haircut? Can we <laughs> say that? What's a, what's a common haircut that he was paying for? So, it depends on if I'm going to them or if they're coming to me. Let's do both. Let's say both. Just for that, for example. Okay, so... And I know it varies and all that stuff. Sure. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but I'm curious. Okay. What so, do you pay for this? So I've had people pay as much as 500 for a haircut. Okay. And down typically more common, 150. 150. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's so, right. Okay, so Anderson Cooper, who else? Um, so Matthew Broderick. I cut Matthew Broderick's hair. Okay. That, was, that was actually a fun story um, because Anderson calls me on my cell phone one day and goes, uh, hey, Yoshi, Anderson, right? And, yeah. and I'm like, hey, Anderson, how are you, buddy? And he's like, good, good. I have a friend who I recommended to you. He's going to be calling you for a haircut. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. And I'm like, oh, great, thanks. And he's like, okay, cool. So just so you know, his name's Matthew Broderick. I'm like, oh, okay. I don't know who that is. Thanks. You know, I'm thinking <laughs> in my head. Right? Yeah. I'm like, okay, thanks. You know, I was thinking it was going to be like, I don't know, some guy I'd never heard of, right? Right, yeah. So I said, thanks, Anderson. I appreciate it. And then hung up. And then later that day, I get this call. Is this Yoshi? I'm like, yeah. He goes, hi, my name is Matthew Broderick. I got your name and number from Anderson. And I'm thinking, oh, this is so funny. You know? <laughs> <laughs> How often does this happen? And um, long story short, I went and cut Matthew's hair. And, you know, he's telling me, he goes, you know, I normally don't pay more than $15 down in Astro Place, right? He goes, yeah. this is like crazy for me to work over this type of dough. He goes, but long story short, my wife, who's Sarah Jessica Parker, yeah. uh, her Sex and the City 1 was coming out. And so he goes, my wife's movie premiere is this weekend. And she told me I have to get a haircut for the red carpet. And um, so Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker called Anderson and said, who cuts your hair? And he says, oh, it's this, you know, Yoshi guy. She goes, yeah. well, can you hook him up with Matthew? And so that's, that's how that happened. Nice. Which is cool because Sarah Jessica Parker is this icon of fashion. Yeah. And she appreciated my work on Anderson's head to do her husband's head. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> maybe a couple more name drops there because I'm just curious too. Who else? Sure. So uh, Joan Osborne was another client that I had. Um, you know, she sung that. She was a singer at a, what if God was one of yeah. us? Yeah. So, uh, and I didn't know who that was. I'd actually never heard of that song. Um, I'd cut her hair several times. Um, you know, and one day somebody asked me, you know, how does it feel? And I was one of my colleagues and I was like, how does what feel? You know, yeah. to cut a star. Someone who was like at the number one hit, you know, at the time it was the number one song. And I was like, oh, who, which one? Yeah. You know, she goes, the one you just did. And I was like, oh, I don't even know who that was. She goes, it's Joan Osborne. And she goes, I go, I don't even, you know, she starts singing me the song. I'd never heard the song. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I had to go and figure out what song it was and listen. Um, but, uh. People that also came to the salon were people like Jerry Seinfeld, Chevy Chase, oh, wow. um, Chuck Mangione, another jazz musician. Uh, lots of, uh, uh, you know, I also did the daughter, the blonde, I don't remember her name, but she was the blonde daughter on the show Roseanne. Okay, um, uh, Yeah, and um, so there were a lot of also actors that you, you recognize their face, but maybe didn't know your, their name yeah. so much, but a lot of them came to the salon. So like at Vidal Sassoon, it had a high recognizable clientele, a uh, high percentage of people that came in and you went, oh my gosh, I know you from that show or I just don't know your name or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then people like Jerry Seinfeld that you're like, oh my gosh, it's Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. <laughs> and, and can you treat them? Can you go in there and be like, hey Jerry, can I get a picture? Or do you have to kind of keep that, oh, you know, professional. Oh, I'm not impressed by this, you know, let's keep it professional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and everybody could, but except one guy by the name of Joseph. Now Joseph was this older Cuban guy who did whatever he wanted, uh, told the management whatever he wanted to do was 
Golden, and he used to be the old manager, and so he he was the only guy who could get away with going up to Jerry Seinfeld and and his really deep Cuban accent, telling an unfunny joke, and then laughing, walking away. Like if I did that, I would probably got fired. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, but he was he was he was very valuable to the company. He was one of the most busiest stylists in the company, so they were not going to fire. Right. Him. <laughs> interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so I want to jump. You were in New York, and obviously you were doing that. You just talked about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then you invented this product, which another layer to the Yoshi onion, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So tell the story a little bit about that. And I know the story's on your website, which we'll link to it in the in the notes here so people can see it. Yeah. But um, So while standing on the corner of 94th and Amsterdam, waiting across the street to go to work, the light was red. Uh, I should say the light was red over here. I was heading west and north, uh, uh, south to north. Well, the traffic was going, so the light was uh, green, forgive me. So it was red for me to cross, green for the traffic. So just waiting for the light to turn, I could see across the street, there was a petite young lady who had a golden retriever. And in New York City, we don't have yards. So to exercise your dog, you everybody walks their dog to the bank, the post office, the grocery store, um, just wherever, because that's the only time your dog gets exercise. So lots of people are walking their dogs doing their errands. Um, this particular young lady uh, was going to the coffee shop. She was trying to get into the coffee shop. So she was, and there was a light post. Uh, so it was a little bit thicker. It was probably, you know, this big. So you've got to have a lot of dog leash to wrap around that. And that's what she was doing. She wrapped it around. She was trying to pull enough so she could actually tie the knot. Okay. And the dog was winning the battle. As she pulled, the dog was pulling, and you could see one hand on the post, trying not to, you know, get her face smashed in. And she's pulling like this, and they're going, and as she starts to pull, the dog sits, she goes like this, and then the dog goes off again. Purse comes down, yanks her arm, um, her purse hits the ground, you know, kind of slides down the leash, hits the ground, stuff spills out, she's really upset now. Pulls really tight. Finally gets this knot in, picks up her purse and goes into the coffee shop and the dog's trying to follow her. And so this knot's getting tighter. And I'm thinking, just just standing at the light, waiting to cross the street, I'm thinking, wow, there's got to be an easier way. I just watched this whole scenario go down. And then like that, it came to me. Well, why, why not like a belt, right? Different size waist, it's got multiple holes. We can adjust it to our size waist. And I thought, like a belt. Let's, and then... Uh, in my mind, I said, oh, that's a great idea. Someone should do that. I was a hairstylist. You know, I was, I was in the fashion industry. I'm not going to invent a dog leash. So for four years, I watched people because it became more obvious. Like, I, I probably saw people tie their dog, but after that day, I started noticing it more and more and more. Yeah. Outside of Starbucks, every coffee shop, every restaurant, people had dogs tied up. And I thought, for four years, someone should really do that leash. That You know, my idea. Four years goes by, and I thought, you know, why not me? Why not me? Who cares if I'm a hairstylist? Yeah. I can try that. So I patent the idea and, and then uh, it's been a slow process and a slow learning curve. I know nothing about the pet industry. It was not my industry. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, we finally launched the company. We're, we're probably shouldn't say this because I don't want to jinx myself, but we're in negotiation with PetSmart right now. Oh, nice. Yeah. So nice. that would be the pinnacle. Now they might not like it, but we're talking back and forth. They approached us. Actually, they found us and uh, expressed interest in that was a really cool phone call. <laughs> I mean, that, you're extremely successful as a hairstylist, obviously, and this, this product here you're showing, like, yes. it's brilliant in its simplicity. It's awesome. Yes, like, thank you. It, it really is. I mean, it's cool. And I was like, as I watched that, you know, you told me about this before, and I went and watched your website, and it's, you know, great tutorials and stuff how to do this, and I was like, that's brilliant. I mean, thank that you. right there, that alone, people hang their hat on one accomplishment, one great product. They're like, this is it. This is my big million-dollar idea, which may, it probably is. But, you know, it's just, just one of another layer of, of what you do, you know? Well, thank you. Thank so you. I hope that, you know, when people are watching this, they can see, maybe, you've, maybe it's in PetSmart at this point, right? Yeah, yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Um, can yeah, show them. Show, show so them basically, you know, the normal leash has one swivel hook and then yep. the other side has a handle, right? Well, I've got two and it's totally symmetric and even. So it doesn't matter what side goes onto your dog. You could pick it up and let's say it's that side. But then you have these grommets that go down the leash and... This first guy creates your handle and off you go. But then you get to that lamp, that light post, and you want to wrap it around the light post rather than tying a knot, boom, you've got secured around a tree or a pole or, or a park bench. Um, and uh, you know, for me, I, I like jogging hands-free, so I actually do it around my waist. 
Yeah. And then uh, that way I don't have to hold my leash while I run. And you said you got a patent on that. So what type, I don't know much about patents. What type of patent do you have on these? So if I'm not mistaken, it's a design patent, okay. uh, which uh, protects the idea of Leash with grommet? Yeah, leash with grommet and swivel hook doing that. Cool. So someone could put a grommet potentially, but they cannot have a swivel hook that goes into it because then they're breaching my patent. Nice. Uh, they could obviously have a swivel hook and not a grommet, but you know, they can't yeah. do this. Yeah. Um, what was interesting is... And I don't know how they do it different, because I mean, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. It's simple, but it's amazing, you know? Thank you, thank you. You know, and, and as entrepreneurs, we try and do everything ourselves in the beginning. We try and figure stuff out. Right. I remember, so I was living in Manhattan, of course. I was, that's where I got the ideas, living in Manhattan. And uh, I researched where the patent library was on Manhattan. It was downtown. I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go patent it myself, right? Yeah. So I, I head on down, um, and I, I, I had learned that I needed to do a patent search. So I head on down to this library. And I walk in the front door and, and it's kind of like Barnes and Nobles where there's somebody sitting at a front desk that you can say, hey, I'm looking for this book and they direct you. So I walk in and say, I'm, you know, I'm looking to do a patent search on an idea that I have. Can you direct me to where I would go? And she, she looked and said, that whole wall of books is what you'd look for. Did she say it like that? That whole... <laughs> exactly. Elongated and, for effect. Exactly. And it was a huge wall. And I just looked and she says, all those are patents. And I mean, I'm not kidding you, the, the wall was larger than my house. So there's no shortage of intellectual property in this no, world. No, and, and the, you know, the stack, you know, the books, the highest bookshelf was way over my head to the floor. And wow. so I, I literally looked at the wall and said, thank you, turned around and went home. I, I was going to say, dude, you, if you actually walked up and picked up a book and opened it, you would have gone farther than 99% of the people in this world. Yeah. Like looking at that going, okay, I'm going to start today. Yeah. Let's do this. Yeah. Man. I'm glad you turned around and walked out. Yeah. And that's when I said, I'm hiring a patent search uh, company. Turns out it was 200 bucks to do a patent search. Really? Yeah. I didn't know. See, I think sometimes you think you got to go do things yourself, like you said, but really yeah. reinventing the wheel yeah. It's not really worth doing. No, no, exactly. Exactly. Wow. And so, you know, it's just that I, I find a lot of entrepreneurs have that, like, I need to go figure this out myself. Yeah. And, and, and within time, I've slowly backed off that train of thought. I'm like, no, I'm going to pay someone who knows how to do this to tell me how to do it now. Yeah. You know, and I've learned this recently too. It's just the more, the reason to get money is to buy back time, right? To yeah. pay people to do things so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then that velocity continues to increase as the more money you can get, the more people's time that you can buy to research things for you to grow even bigger and better and, and do more, right? So, right. But I think you're right. Starting out, people are just like, I'm not paying anyone to do yeah. something I can do for myself, right? Yeah. I'm going to cut my own yard. Yeah. I'm going to research my own patents. I'm going to do everything myself, right? Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. You know what? And I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to start another layer you've got okay. here. It's extremely interesting to me as well. My wife was in the middle of writing a children's book, right? So when mm. you told me the other day that you're like, "Hey, I want I wrote a children's book." I was like, "What?" <laughs> the other layer to the onion. So talk about show this children's book yes. and talk a little bit about what it was and you know, we actually bought one. You, you yeah, talked about that, that. We went on the website and bought one. Thank I you. Read, I read to my kids every night and I read that to them. One Monday night, we, uh, we did a family home evening and, and we read that and it was awesome. Thank you. It was awesome. So talk about this too. I appreciate that. So uh, basically, it was my mother's idea. Uh, my sister 10 years ago had her first child, Delaney. And my mom was a huge educator to me and my sister on the prevention of sexual abuse. Um, and my mother said, we've got to figure out a way to educate Delaney, but uh, it's not grandma's place, it's mom's place, right? With, with us, it was my mom's place. So she was really careful on how she approached my sister on, you know, can we educate your daughter? You know, I, I don't, maybe you are already, please don't be offended if you are, I just want to make sure. Um, and uh, basically what had happened is my mom said, hey, you know, can you go pick a, a book, children's book on the prevention of sexual abuse at Barnes and Nobles, which I went to do and there was no such thing as a book for the child. There were books for the adult to read to themselves and then have that conversation. So what had happened was... That's an awkward topic. I think people are like, how are you going to address this in a, you know, a way that's not awkward? Right? Exactly. So Exactly. So um, what had happened was my wife and I, or excuse me, my mother and I wrote the, the words. Uh, it's in a rhyming sequence, so it's kind of fun for the child. Um, and then my wife illustrated the pictures through the book um, and uh, basically, you know, did all the illustrations. And this was actually just printing paper stapled, 
That was the, the, that was original, the original book. book. Yeah. That was as far as it was going to go. Exactly. Wow. And because and, and, it was really just for Delaney. It was a book to, to educate Delaney. And what had happened was a lot of my mother's friends were saying, you know, they'd see it at, yeah. at her house. And they'd go, Eva, you know, and they'd start flipping through it and reading it. And it's in, you could see it's an easy read. It's not going to take too long. And they'd be like, this is great. You know, who, why'd you do this? And they're like, well, it's for Delaney. And they said, well, there are other children besides Delaney that should really read this. Yeah. And so at that point, we had seeked out the help of uh, Richard Paul Evans, who is a 13 time, maybe more by now, New York bestselling author for, he wrote The Christmas Box. Yep. And believe it or not, Robert Allen. A, yeah, a, a real estate, real estate guy. Yeah. yeah. So we seeked out the help of those two individuals and um, they helped us get it published and, and, and actually make it a reality. You know, which is really, what's really cool about that too, it's a board book. Because as my wife was going through stuff saying, which way do I want to publish this book or which way do I want to do it? You know, you have the, just the normal books, but the board books are the yeah. ones that they stand the test of time, the kids are biting on them, everything. Yeah. Much more user friendly. And I read book, I read two books to my kids every night. So that's awesome. That's the best, you know, and the size of everything, it's great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, um, again, another layer to the Yoshi Onion, a, an author. So, yeah. and, that, and it's you know on this blog, we'll we'll post it at the bottom too, so people can click on that and see if they want to. Well, thank you. Know, check that out and <laughs> buy that, which we did. I mean, my wife was like, she loves that. So well, now, well, did you have something else you want to say? Oh, I was just gonna say the the highlight so far of the book. Yeah. Um, I got an email uh, from the general, uh, the uh, uh, the attorney general. Um, counseling division for, for the state of Utah. And I got this email and I can't remember his name right now off the top of my head and he just said, hey, I just wanted to introduce myself really quickly. I'm the individual who interviews uh, abused children for oh, the first wow. time. And uh, we had an individual who came in, uh, a young little boy, and we were talking to him and, and I asked the mother, you know, because it only had happened once, you know, sexual abuse can go for years and years before a child will ever say anything. And I asked the mother, you know, what, what are you, you know, why do you think he spoke up so quick? And she said, you know, the only thing I can think of is coincidentally, I read him a book the other night and, and, uh, or, or recently, maybe not the other night, but recently. And, uh, he goes, what was the name of that book? And, and she told him, so he went online and researched it and then shot me an email saying, Hey, I just want to say thank you for putting that out there. So then I replied and said, you know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, sh we shipped him an entire box of books because I figured if he's working with these children, we shipped him an entire box. Uh, I got an email about two weeks later. Uh, obviously, the book books took some time to get to him. And then he said, you know, here's something that uh, since the time our, of our last conversation, I can elaborate on. We've done a full investigation of this individual and turns out he had already been sexually abusing another child for about two years. So he said, you just saved two children instead of one and possibly more that we don't know of. So that was the highlight of that book so far, getting that email, knowing, wow, we've affected and helped some people, children, Dude, kids. That's really cool. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't mean to go into the tangent. That's oh, really cool, dude. Thank you. Um, <laughs> let's transition into real estate, man. Let's get, get yeah. off that topic. <laughs> Dude, that's gotta be a really cool effect. Yeah, that was, it was, it was, it was People amazing. do all this stuff for, you know, money. That's awesome. Thank you. That's seriously cool. Thank you. All right, we're gonna get off that. <laughs> so I wanna know how you transitioned into real estate too. Cause your dad had this effect on you it seemed, but you didn't really know. So what point, you know, you've gone through, you know, Vidal Sassoon, you're, you know, this to the stars, you're doing all this information product. What shifted you back to real estate? Cause I know you're really active in real estate right now. Yeah. What, did you read a book? I mean, what, what turned you on? Like, oh yeah. Real estate. Duh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a funny story cause uh, it took me having to go from making a comfortable living as a hairstylist to becoming dead broke. And the reason why would why, you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Why would I become dead broke? So what happened was, um, there was, I had a dream as a child to play college football. Well, the pros, but I, I never saw even college, which was a dream because you have to get to college to go to the pros. Um, and, and uh, you know, my dad kind of, you know, was very strong personality, he kind of dictated what I would do. And, and I, I'm not saying he's the only parent who tells their kids, this is what you're going to study, this is what you're going to do. I'm sure a lot of kids go through that. Um, but he took that dream away from me. Um, and... 
I told myself as I got a little bit older, I will never let that happen again. I will never let anyone take away a dream. You can take away my car, I can go get another one. Yeah. But if a dream is gone, you, you can't get that back sometimes. Did, did you resent that a little bit? I mean, obviously. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so um, that was very hard for me uh, because uh, you know, as I got older, I realized eh, that dream's officially dead, yeah. right? Um, so I also had a dream to be an actor. I cut the hair of the rich and famous and uh, it was a dream of mine to be in the entertainment business. Uh, you know, I used to, I used to as a child sing and, sing and dance, kind of like the Bobby Brown, wow. MC Hammer stuff, right, in high school. Dude, have you ever been inhibited? Have you ever felt like, you know, <laughs> really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, you, can, you feel like you can do anything. I mean, it sounds like you feel like you can do anything, because... I surely yeah. feel like I could try anything. <laughs> yeah. But that, most people don't try, though. So right, anyway. right. So, so, you know, I thought originally I wanted to be a singer. You know, I used to perform and all that stuff in high school in a group. I had a, you know, it was a boy. It was, I wouldn't say we were a boy band because we danced, you know, competitively more than we sang. But we also would try and sing. Uh, didn't get very far. Break but, dancing? What yeah, dancing? Yeah, break dancing. Can you still that, break dance? I, I have not. Could, if, we, if we put a cardboard box out here, could you do that spin around thing? I might be able to do one rotation. All right. Yeah, that's better than I could do. Man. That's awesome. So That's a layer that we're never we're not going to get to, but that's yeah. cool. <laughs> so basically, long story short, um, the, the, the last six years that I lived in New York, I can't you know, so probably by year 12 of living there, being a hairstylist to the rich and famous, I said, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to go be an actor. I, at least I'm going to go pursue it. So it was a really, really hard decision. Scary, super scary, because I had a consistent, comfortable income that came in. And um, I said, and New York is not a cheap place. And I, I didn't have roommates, and I didn't want to go to have a roommate, I, you know, and so I, I said, you know what, I'm, if I'm gonna do it, I gotta do it. So I, I quit, I quit cutting hair in the salon. Now I kept some of my clients, like Anderson and other clientele, that I'd go to their house, uh, but I lost probably 75% of my clientele because they didn't want me to come to their house or their job. They liked the relaxation of coming to a salon and being pampered, mm -hmm. right? Because when you go to those salons, you're pampered. You're, you're getting a head massage. You're getting, uh, you know, coffee and tea and food served to you. I mean, it's another experience than, you know, just going to get a haircut. And so they didn't want to give that up. So a lot of my income became short and I, you know, it was cut. It, not like more than half. Yeah. But I had some saved. I had some saved. So I thought I'm going to go pursue acting. I'm going to cut hair on the side, and I'm going to have to get what I used to call, and, and I don't mean this to be offensive to anybody, but high school jobs, jobs that you could go get and didn't care if you lost. That was a yeah. high school job, right? And um, high school job meaning that I would go get a job because I still needed money, and if an audition came that was more important than the job, I would call in sick, and if they fired me, I wouldn't care because I'd just go get another high school job. They weren't careers. Yeah. Um, what I found out that uh, um, is uh, why everyone's a waiter or a bartender, because you need that whole day. You don't know when that audition's gonna happen, so yeah. you can work your nights. So, so that's why they do it. That's why they do it, okay. yeah, I had no idea. So, so I went, uh, long story short, I quit my job for six years, and um, depleted my savings really quick. Yeah. And then was dead broke in, in um, living in Manhattan. Uh, my favorite high school job, though, is I sold the audio tour at the top of the Empire State Building. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what's funny is they hired actors to do that because we'd get on a microphone. And I don't know if you've been in the Empire State Building, but the line is like hundreds of people zigzag like a, like a ride, you know, okay. like a, an amusement park. So you, you couldn't have fear of talking to an audience. So you get on the mic and these people were in line they were grouchy. They were there for two hours trying to get to the elevator, take them to the top and you can say, hey guys, welcome to the Empire State Building. Don't forget to pick up your audio tour so you can know what you're looking at. Brooklyn, Queens, New Jersey, Central Park, Wall Street, right? You're, you're selling it, you're giving facts and you're tempting them to want to buy it when they get to, yeah. the, to the elevator. So that was my favorite high school job. It was yeah, kind of cool. fun. Yeah, I worked with that's a bunch cool. of cool people. They were all actors. A lot of them were comedians. And yeah. so, but um, long story short, I depleted my savings and then was officially dead broke. Okay. Uh, just barely got by and uh, I had to get a roommate, which, uh, which worked out really well. It turned out uh, a buddy of mine from here, from Salt Lake, uh, his brother was moving there. And so, um, 
he hooked us up and so it was kind of cool because I had some trust in this guy because I already knew his little brother. Um, but after six years of being dead broke, you know, I had all this energy for the first few years. Ah, I'm living my dream. I'm pursuing it. This is a sacrifice. It gets old being broke for six years. Yeah. <laughs> And at that point, I said, I got to find something flexible. And I started thinking, what could I do? And I remember my dad doing real estate. And I said, duh. And I actually had, I had one rental property at that time that I had bought when I was cutting hair. Um, you, where was it? Uh, it was actually this house. Oh, this house we're in right now. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So we bought this as a rental property uh, in 2000. And um, so when I was sitting there trying to think of what I should do, you know, and every month, this rental income was coming in, this cash flow. I thought, duh. Yeah. Why not do real estate? So you didn't even, you never thought of that before. No. It just wasn't, it was, your dad did it. Yeah. It, it, his, your dad doing that was able to make him afford to send you to the best hair school in the world. Yeah. And your first two years in New York, it sounds like your dad paid for this stuff. All of that, but it never dawned on you to say, how come my dad has so much money or has yeah. financially independent, right? Never did. Wow. It's crazy. Okay. It's crazy. Yeah. And then, and so somewhere in that whole being broke, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So that's, was that the first time you read that book? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting too. Because I yeah. wanted to ask you what, you're, what it's like. Do you read all the time? Are you constantly educating yourself? Constantly. So even before you read that, were you reading like hair books? Were you reading like patent books, obviously? Or I mean, anything, were you always educating yourself? Yeah, I was always educating myself in fashion at the time. Gotcha. You know, I loved fashion. Um, and uh, um, oddly enough, uh, in high school, way before I was even in the fashion industry, I was... Uh, uh, awarded my senior year most fashionable in high school. Uh, so I've always liked it a little yeah. bit, I think because of my parents. You know, there was always the high-end fashion magazines in our house growing up as kids. Mm. So I had a higher sense of what was in style in London, Tokyo, New yeah. York, um, even in even as little. But uh, yeah. yeah, it was... Uh, so so you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and that's like I mean, you lived it because yeah. you were helping your dad with rental properties. But that it took reading that at that time in your life to have that paradigm shift, that boom, yes. aha moment of ah, yes, okay. Yes. Go on from there. What, what did that do for you? What did you do from that point? Uh, at that point, then I seeked out as much education as I possibly could. When it hit me, it hit me. And believe it or not, my first mentor was Robert Allen. Uh, his, okay. program, his program. His program, okay. So uh, I went into his program and, um, uh, you know, forked over the, the big bucks okay. that it was to, to enter the year program. And uh, Oh, you did the whole year program. Yeah, I did the entire year and just committed myself. Like, like everything else I do, I commit, you know, I just, yeah. I don't try it. If I'm doing it, it's committing. Yeah. My job, be an actor, it didn't happen, but six years, commit myself. And, and for some people, six is probably short. For others, yeah. it's, it's long, it's all relative, I guess. But um, I said, I gotta keep pursuing acting and I need some income, so boom, I started pursuing real estate. Uh, okay. and, and getting, basically just started getting educated anywhere I could. Okay, um, so you found the mentorship program, you paid the big bucks for it, you're in this year-long program. Yeah. What did that look like and what did you get a result as a result of that? Um, I, through that year, had actually done seven transactions. Wow. And what type of transactions were they? Um, flips and rentals. Flips and rentals, cool. Yep, yep. And uh, what had happened was... Did you make money with those two, by the way? I did. Like, I did. Yeah. Um, thankfully, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was It was before the crash. So, uh, okay. So... Um, we made, it was actually just before, because what, it, what was interesting is um, we researched just out of curiosity the, the, one of the flips, and we sold at a really good price relatively at to the what very top. I mean, you're talking 07, mid 07, yeah, you sold yeah, that thing? Yeah, so we were lucky, lucky, lucky. Because, you know, that's not something we would have known to predict you know, and figure out. Speaking of that, I just shot a video yesterday about real estate tracking. I track uh, real estate in our market, you know. And, Every month, uh -huh. so I, you know, so you can see that writing on the wall. So you say, "How would we ever known?" Yeah, yeah. I, I track that. So anyway, that's interesting, right? Every month, I see how many actives are on the market, how many are under, under contract, how many sold. So you can always be seeing is the supply and the demand. How's that in our local market? So yeah, anyway, you would have known then, but how does anybody know? How does a new person in real estate know that? Exactly. You don't. Exactly. So. So you do those seven transactions. Seven successful. transactions. Um, yeah, and uh, some of them we still have to this day in our rental portfolio. They bring in the passive income, which was a huge 
weight off the shoulders when you're, you know, working at the top of the Empire State Building for, yeah. I think it was $14 an hour selling the audio tour to yeah. have this Which $14 day. an hour sounds like a lot of money, and it, and it is, you know, kind of relatively, like, sure. in Utah. But in Manhattan, yeah. that's nothing. No. Like, that's... That's yeah. nothing. A yeah. bagel costs fourteen dollars yeah, a half, right? Exactly. I went on vacation there and I had to leave. You know. Yeah. So. <laughs> exactly. I, I literally ate ramen every day for a period of my life because you know you can get four for a dollar. Yeah. And it got so old eating ramen. You know the good old fashioned hot water. So then yeah. I'd start eating it straight out of the package, crunchy. Just That's actually not bad, food. actually. That's, it's not that, bad. That, that actually, tastes pretty good. Yeah. Now I crunch it up sometimes and put it on my salad. But yeah. uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. But it was. But not just, every day. Not every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So then tell me your transition. So you, you started that first year with that mentorship program. You did these seven deals. You made money, thankfully. Yeah. So how's that transition now? Because I know you're not full-time real estate now. Yeah. Um, but what does that look like for you now? Um, so now predominantly, you know, so our model, my, when I say our, my wife gets as much credit as I do. Our model, we decided, was we were going to fix and flip to buy rentals. Mm. So we take the chunks from a flip and put it towards a down or whatever, towards, a, towards another rental, so we could build this passive income portfolio. Um, originally, our model was, you know, so, so Robert Allen said, how much, figure out how much, how much uh, expenses do you have a month? This was, this was a conversation that he had to a small group of us one day, and he says, how much expenses do you have a month? So, you know, take it some time to write it down. So we all thought about it. And uh, I was like in my head, well, it's probably by the time you pay this, 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 about five grand-ish a month, your car, this and that. Yeah. So he goes, okay, now let's break it down. How many, you know, houses do you need to achieve that, that uh, expense? And he goes, and it's going to depend. Is that house free and clear? Does it have a mortgage? Is it only bringing 50, 100, 200? Yeah. Right? He goes, so think about kind of like... Uh, some of you that have properties now, what that would be, and if not, what you know, what you're thinking based off of what you have, and we can go into that deeper. The moral of the story was, he says, a lot of people think financial freedom is a million dollars in the bank. It's not. It's it's when your passive income supersedes your monthly expense. So financial freedom technically is only five thousand a month, because we only had five thousand a month of expenses. Yeah. So, me and my wife after that day went back and sat down and said. If we can get five houses that rent for a thousand each, and they were all free and clear, technically a five house portfolio makes you financially free, yep. right? So that was our goal. So we went out and we'd flip, 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 and then take the chunks and go buy a free and clear house. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, we were, we were, our markets at the time, we had this house in Salt Lake. We also did upstate New York and Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri was our predominant market because it was the most affordable market of the three, Rockland County, New York, Salt Lake City, and Kansas City. So we were flipping and buying a free and clear house in Kansas City. Talk about how much did that cost in Kansas City? Was it a standard free and clear house that you were buying or house that you buy? What did that cost? About 60,000 at the time. And it would rent for? A thousand. A thousand bucks, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So you could flip three houses for 20 grand each yep. and then own a free and clear house. That's cool. So that was what we did. So we bought a portfolio large enough that our passive income then met our expenses. Now you hit that goal. We hit that goal. Awesome. Yeah. And, and then you soon realize, wait, I need one more because one's always vacant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not five passive incomes home. You really need six because the one's going to be vacant. Yeah. But, um, but we hit that goal and that, that was when, uh, you know, it really became, this is so powerful. Yeah. Real estate so powerful. And, and it didn't have to be. Donald Trump. It didn't have to be a you know a portfolio of fifty houses. It was five. Five, and it was doable, and you did it. Yeah, you took it down. Yeah. You know, I want to ask you this too. Um, if you could go back to yourself and talk to yourself at eighteen years old, you know, Brad Paisley's got this song called you know write a letter to me or whatever. Uh huh. I think it's an interesting concept. Yeah. What would you tell yourself if you could get a time machine back or write yourself a letter and suit it back to yourself at 17, 18 years old? What would you tell yourself? Ah. Uh. I would tell myself to definitely try to play football. You know, I, I don't even know if I would have made the team. Most likely I wouldn't have. I'm not the biggest guy. My dad was right. Japanese Mexicans don't get to be very big. <laughs> um, but I, I would have told myself to try because I'm not afraid to fail. I've never been afraid to fail. Um, and uh, so that would have been the first thing I would have said. 
just just tell your dad you want one year in college, not a quarter, a full year. So you can go try out, not make the team, and feel okay that you didn't do it because you tried. With the acting thing, I have no regrets. That I, six years I tried, yeah, you know, and technically that dream's not done. The beautiful thing about an actor is you can be 80. With football, you've got to be, you know, in your athletic prime. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I would definitely say um, go back and do that. And, and then I would have told myself to start buying real estate, uh, you know, right away. Uh, so as soon as I became a hairstylist, um, you know, I, I actually enjoyed those parts of my life being in the fashion industry. The fashion industry introduced me to people like Anderson Cooper, Matthew Broderick. Uh, you know, I have some interesting folks in my cell phone, phone book, yeah. you know. Um, it broadened your horizons, too. It told you what was possible. It yeah. increased your mindset, probably. Exactly. And it was, a, you know, it was really, it, it, you know, at a very um, young age, I... I really enjoyed the international sense of friends that I had too at 18, like I was mentioning, those friends were priceless. Some of them I still keep in touch with, some of them you know, I've lost touch with, uh, some of them I found back again through Facebook, through Facebook. but uh, um, I would have definitely started buying real estate a lot sooner. Um, and I would have you know, definitely pursued one year of college and tried to play football and who knows what happened. Maybe nothing, but who cares? So now I want to know something else. What's some stuff that you do every day or if not every day you try to do it every day so what do you put in because i think success is found in your daily actions you know the things that you do every day without fail yeah what do you try to do every day without fail a study i used to hate studying i love studying and and reading um you know when i tell people i love to read their first question is oh uh, harry potter you know like that's like no i don't i don't read any of that it's all um you know real estate internet marketing marketing, just business in general, to expand my, my ideas and my creativity. Um, I, you know, it's, the brain's like a muscle, I, I think, right? If you don't work it out, it shrinks. If you work it out, it can grow. And uh, so I'm constantly working out my brain to make that muscle stronger. Um, and, and I love how you said that. Tony Robbins says, you know, success of any nature is something you do every day. I watched him, uh, Give a, I, I, it was a video, uh, not, I didn't actually have the privilege of going to his show live, but he looked out in the audience and he pointed, he goes, that guy, I can tell he works out every day or he wouldn't look like that. He goes, yeah. that guy doesn't work out every day because he looks like that. Right. <laughs> I don't know if the guy was heavy or what, but he was poking fun, but you know that that success of his physique came because of everyday activity, from the dieting that he does every day to the, you know, and so for me, because I want to have you know, that type of creativity, you know, you see some of these guys who are just so quick to think of how to do a deal. You know, I'll look at a deal today and I can think of three ways to do it much quicker than when I first started. I only maybe thought of one way to do it. And there are guys who can think of 10 ways when I'm only thinking of three, you know, and that's because their brain is stronger than mine right now. Right. And, and that's where I want my brain to be is I want to be able to look at a house and go, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, but I can do that and that will make me money. Wow. Other than, rather than walking away thinking, oh, that doesn't have any money to be made. I love that. You educate yourself every day in the field that you're trying to pursue at that point. Yeah. Talk about your associations. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I'm, I sit on the board of the Salt Lake Real Estate Investment Association, and that has been extremely valuable. Uh, having moved here from New York City, uh, I had friends. Well, I should say having moved back from New York City, having grown up here, I had friends. Uh, but uh, the majority of my friends were not in real estate. So um, I knew that I needed to grow my association of real estate investors. Why did you know that? Why um, does that matter? You know, I realized that I got where I was in the hair industry because of my association with other hairstylists that were further along than I was. These people that were doing editorial work, you know, when you're a hairstylist, the pinnacle of your career typically is when you're doing editorial for television, high-end magazines, celebrities, you know, that's, that's kind of, it's all relative of, of what one may think is the pinnacle of their career, but it's around those things. You know, if you're, if you're working and for some people, it's more simple it's just to, to make a good living in the hair salon. But for the guys that aspire to be the Michael Jordan of hair, they're typically the ones that uh, have done editorial work of some nature. Uh, they've done celebrities hair. They, you know, they're doing it on, on magazines, on television. Um, and, uh, I knew that I got where I was because of that association of, of, of being around all those types of guys. So many of the hairstylists that I work with at Vidal Sassoon 
we're, you know, we're doing lots of celebrities. Well, I can give you a perfect example. Anderson Cooper, Sarah Jessica Parker calls Anderson and says, hey, Anderson, who should do my husband's hair? Then, you you know. Yeah. That was your network, right? Yeah. That was just, and I've heard it said before, your network is your net worth. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So I realized that if I was going to do that and duplicate that, then I needed to build an association of successful investors. Um, I had had some success, but it, uh, by no means, you know, when I looked at uh, other investors who were further down the line, did I feel I was successful, you know, relative to them. Yeah. Um, so that association was huge because I met a lot of people there, like yourself, right. um, Matt and Randall, and sh- you know, just the list goes on and on of these right. guys that are doing more numbers than I am. And they are where you want to be, or they're doing more than you, so you're thinking, I want to go do that. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. And it keeps it exciting because you have a goal, yeah. right? If you've reached your goal and you don't set a new one, then then life starts to become stale. Like, yeah. now what? There's always a new mountain to climb, right? Yeah. You look at this pinnacle and you say, I want to climb that mountain. And you go climb that mountain. You get to the top of that and you look down the mountain at the people who are thinking you're the guru at that point. Yeah. You know, there's always, you, know, you can feel a little bit good about that, you know? But you can't think of that too long because you can always look up and you're at this peak and you look up and you see there's another peak up there, right? <laughs> yeah. You didn't even know what you didn't know at that point, right? And exactly. you're climbing towards that peak. Yep. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's yeah. interesting. So anything else that's a, you know, a non-negotiable in your day? Anything else that you, you do? Um, let's see. You know, as of recent, I've been more conscientious of, of uh, I should say recent as of like six months. Um, there was a time where I was very athletic. You know, I was an aspiring boxer in Brooklyn and uh, I was in shape and I was, you know, lean and could run for miles. Uh, you know, and, and then fell out of shape. And I thought, well, to get me back into shape, I'm gonna run the New York Marathon, which is what I did and trained. And the, the minute that marathon was over, I stopped working out again. And um, I've just decided recently, as of six months ago, to hire a personal trainer, uh, because you have that sense of um, obligation, you know. Um, if you don't show accountability, right? Accountability, thank you. Well, that, and they're better at it than you too. I think this, there's, a, there's a theme I'm seeing here in your life, right? Your dad was kind of like, you know, a mentor to you and kind of guided you there. A personal trainer now recently, or you said the Robert Allen courses, you, you sought those things out and you weren't afraid to pay for that accountability or to pay for that, like, I'm gonna go do this, right? Yes, yes, I mean, exactly. I'm trying to get a window here into why you're successful, because obviously you're successful and you've been successful in a lot of different things. Well, thank you, thank you. So, yeah, it, that's it exactly. You know, I remember thinking, I'll never hire a trainer. I know how to work out, because I used to work out all the time. Right. And then it's, uh, then you realize, you're not paying the trainer necessarily. Well, you are. You are. I, there's so much that I've learned that I didn't even know I didn't know. Right. Uh, he's got um, his name. I don't know if you've ever heard of John Madsen. He used to play for the Oakland Raiders. So he opened okay. up a, a gym here for athletes. And it's, it's in Salt Lake City. It's in Salt. It's, it's in Sandy. Yeah, Salt Lake City. We'll throw a link on that at the bottom. Of this. Yeah. He's curious. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, what's interesting that I loved about his gym is it's uh, it's not like gold. It's not like you know Bally's or whatever these other gyms are that you go and you work out. Um, and you hire a personal trainer. His his gym is designed for athletes. So there are there are a lot of collegiate football players, basketball players, baseball players, volleyball, soccer. And what he does is he helps you work on what you need as an athlete: explosion, speed, power. Um, and 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 while you're getting all that, your body is getting refined at the same time. But the goal isn't let's get let's get chiseled. It's let's become more athletic, become more faster because those are his clients, right? Yeah. And to me. That added a twist to working out that made it fun again. Yeah. It was so cool because I'll go into the gym and I'm doing stuff that has to do with athletics opposed to like, let me just lift heavy stuff. You know, as you're saying, I think it'd be interesting because recently I thought, you know, I'm older now, you know, not super old, early 30s though, but I thought back in the day I used to, when I played basketball a lot, you used to be able to dunk, right? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm a taller guy, I'm about 6'4", you know, but I used to be able to dunk. And now I'm, I'm, I'm not even close, I couldn't, I couldn't dunk right now. I could grab the room, that's about it. But I think it'd be cool to do something like that, right? Go to the gym like that and be like, okay, you yeah. know, teach me how to get those, you know, fast switch muscles back and do those things so I can be athletic and so I can go do that again. That would be a cool goal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been super fun. And and that's what I, I you know, I was going to say I knew how to work out, but I really, now that I, I just didn't know how to work out like this at all. Like a lot of the stuff we're doing, 
I would have never done. And in some of it's so brutal, I would never do if I was at the gym by myself. Yeah. Unless someone's telling you to do it, you're not, I mean, even if you oh, know man. to do it, you're like, I'm not doing it. I don't care how driven you are until somebody's there. You're on that 10th set, you yeah. know, or 10th, 10th rep. And it's like, you know, you need to do number 11 because Tony Robbins says that's where all the growth is, right? Yeah. You're breaking down the muscles on that 11th one. The one you want to do the least is the one you should be doing. Yeah. When you're by yourself, you rack it and you're like, yeah. that's called a day, right? You're totally. wiping it off and saying, I worked out hard enough today. Totally. You know, you cheat yourself. So I'm glad you do that, man. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So, uh, so yeah, that's become the other I have to now, you know, it's for the last six months. So hopefully I can stick to it. You know, it's, your yeah. life gets crazy and then you're like, oh, I missed today's workout. And then, yeah. you know, before you know it, you miss. But that's, uh, that is definitely uh, a must every day is working out and studying. Yeah. Okay. Last thing I want to know about is your dad now too. Interesting. Cause you didn't talk about real estate until you know, he showed you those things and it was just kind of in, ingrained in you from a young age. And then you found Rich Dad Poor Dad shifted your paradigm, even though he kind of had it before. Do you talk about real estate with him now? Do you talk about the houses you're flipping, the houses you're gonna keep as rental? How uh, does that? A little bit. Um, yeah. So good question. A little bit. Does um, he look at you as like, ah, oh, grasshopper, you know, you've got much to learn here, right? Like <laughs> go do your little deals and you know, surely he's, he came where you came where he came to America with $200 in his pocket. Yeah. So he's got to respect his son bootstrapping it and yeah. successful with it now. And yeah. Yeah. Um, it, uh, yeah, it, we do chat about it, uh, periodically. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, when we do chat, it's, it's typically typically not like work stuff um but uh um occasionally occasionally we'll chat occasionally he'll want to come see a flip uh you know what i did to it how it looks before he wants to you know we've got one that we're selling right now so he wants to come see it because uh, he saw it before we closed and now uh, yeah. he wants to see it now it's all done that's always the best right the before and afters yeah like, just the snapshots right exactly yeah so yeah occasionally we chat about it um we occasionally will talk about, you know, developing some of his raw land that he has, you know, uh, he, he's not sure how long he's going to hold it before he decides to either sell it to the developer or develop it himself. He's never developed, but, uh, you know, he, he made that investment a long time ago and figured I'd hold it for now. And so we chat about maybe developing it ourselves, but I've never developed either. So man, but I could see this as another layer to the, uh, the Yoshi, the developer, because you've done anything in your life. It sounds like you've grabbed, you've been successful at it, you know, from, the professional hairstylist to like product placement stuff to like, you know, writing the book and just going on getting those rentals so you could have the cash flow to cover your life. If you want to tackle the development world, you know, I, mean, I think you could just grab a few books, jump into it. Yeah. Do it. I have no doubt in my mind that that's the next, you know, if you or she wants to do that, you can do that while you're doing 50 other things, you know, <laughs> and, you. And, and the actor, you know, thank you. So. Well, cool, man. I appreciate yeah. this. This is, this is awesome, right? I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Any final parting wisdom or anything you want to share? Uh, Knowing that we can edit any of this out at any time. Sure, sure. You know, uh, if, if I, I guess I don't have children yet, okay. but when I do, um, one of the things that I'm going to be sure to tell them is, you know, never be afraid to fail. Because the, the, uh, I, I have met uh, so many people. I've had, I had a friend who threw out his life. Uh, he was always ranked in the top three best soccer players in the state of Utah when we were growing up. And the state of Utah, I don't know how long ago, maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago, brought in its first professional indoor soccer team. And I don't even know if they still exist. Uh, long story short, all his friends tried out but him. I didn't know this. I just thought he just wasn't interested in becoming a professional soccer player. And... I found out years and years and years later through a conversation that oddly came up and I was like, yeah, why didn't you ever try out? And he said, uh, you know, I regret it to this day, but I was afraid to fail. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, what if I would have tried out and not made the team? And here I am, the third top three ranked. It was, it was always, it was sometimes one, sometimes it was three, two, one, three, two, one. He goes, what if I would have not made the team? And here I am, the top ranked kid in all of Utah in soccer. But what did that felt like? And I said, well, yeah, it'd suck. You know, he goes, I know, which is, it was easier to not try than to go try and fail, right? He says, it was just simple. It was simple not to try. And he said, what had happened was he found out who made the team and there were guys that were way, you know, through the childhood ranked way below him and, and he knew he was better. And so to this day, he regretted it. Um, 
he just said, I wish, uh, I wish I could take that time back and go back. But he, he, was, he told me he was always so afraid to fail that it, it was easier just not to try. You know, that's a lesson that I think I'm guilty of that and most people are guilty of that. I've learned that recently in my life and I'll continue to learn that lesson. But I see that in my life going back, way back. I was afraid to fail, right? I just, you always think, oh, I'm not good enough for this or that. But in hindsight, you know, you just got to go out there and be the one that's just like, I'm going to do it. And nobody's perfect and nobody knows how to do it when they go. They just step out there and do it. And it's through the act of doing that you get that growth. But if you're always afraid to step out there and buy that first property or or do anything, right? Yeah. Man, throughout my life, I see that. And I wish that my, you know, you said I want to tell that to my kids. Yeah. I wish that I'd heard that. You know, I probably heard it, but had it sunk in earlier yeah. in my life, right? Yeah. Because if you weren't afraid to fail, what would you try? Yeah. Man, it would just it'd change your life if you'd start sooner just saying, there's no limits, right? Exactly. The limits is your mind. Exactly. You know, so that's, exactly. that's awesome advice. So that's that's probably what I'd share. Um, you know, uh, one more thing. To, it's It's like the the check mark of fails that I had. But, uh, you know, in 2002, I watched the Winter Olympics. No, I take that back. It was, yeah, yeah, 2002, I watched the Winter Olympics, and they had just reinstated, after 50 years, the sport of skeleton. Okay. The skeleton's where you go down the uh-huh. side head first, Crazy, as opposed yeah. to the luge. Um, I thought that was an awesome sport, so I went on and Googled it. Turns out, because they hadn't reinstated in 50 years, they were looking for athletes. <laughs> You could have been an Olympic skeleton so, athlete. I tried out. You did? <laughs> I tried out. I, See, that's a t- can't be afraid to fail. Yeah. Try out. What happened? So, well, what had happened was um, I flew. So you could try out in two places: Lake Placid, New York, or Park City, Utah. Those are the only two places in the whole United States okay. that have a slide. Okay. Luckily, one was in Utah. Yeah. So I flew to Utah to the tryouts. Well, you were living in New York. At the time. I was living in New York City at the time. And so I, I told I took a vacation. I was, you know, still a hairstylist and I flew back to New York or to Salt to Park. Dude, this Salt is Lake. a whole other layer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and what was great is because they needed so many athletes, everybody made the tryout to, to, to the next level. Nobody got cut. Wow. Right? So I was like, oh, this is great. I must be like super athletic. <laughs> Olympic host pool. Host yeah. pool. Yoshi and Shiraki. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um the next level, though, was you had to commit to living in Park City or Lake Placid for three months for the season and actually slide. Yeah. So I uh, went back to New York and took a leave of absence and said, I'm going to try out for the Winter Olympics, so I need to take a leave of absence. And my boss was just like, oh, my gosh, really? Is he used to it by now? He's like, Yoshi. Yeah. Because really? you're probably always like, yeah, I'm going to do this dog leash thing yes. and do this and that. He's just like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So... It was. Uh, it made more sense to come to Park City because I could commute from Salt Lake yeah, and live with my parents, and, yeah. and you know I have to pay for board and and so for three months it, I trained like a professional athlete. We would work out every day as a team. Um, every morning we would do sick workouts, conditioning, sprinting, pushing, and then uh, in the evenings we would slide. So um, basically, long story short. The next Olympics was 2006 in Torino, Italy. That was the Olympic that I was hoping that I'd maybe get to That you're hopeful to. for, yeah. Yeah. Only one American made the team because we as a nation at that time were not very good at skeleton for yeah. some reason. Um, and that was not me, unfortunately. But nonetheless... Did you try out for the Mexican team or the Japanese team? Oh my gosh. Yoshi. So, <laughs> thank you. I forgot. So, what had happened was... This, really yeah. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Well, to a degree. To a degree. Okay. So what had happened was um, the coach took a bunch of us into this uh, corner of the training facility, and I didn't realize it, but we were all ethnic. We were all ethnic people at the time. And um, he's talking to us all, and he said, hey, guys, you know, let's be real. Most likely none of you are going to be in Torino. Spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, only one guy, and he'd been doing it for years, uh, made the team, as I yeah. mentioned. So he said, the reason why I brought you all in is because you all have what I'm guessing is a background that leads to another country. He goes, if I was you, and I'm in your shoes, sure, we all want to win the gold medal. We don't want to go to the Olympics uh, and not win the gold medal, but it would just be amazing to go to the Olympics. And we all agreed, yeah. He goes, so if I was you, I would dig back and do some research to see if you could represent the country that maybe you came from, or your heritage came right. from. Well, Japan's team was awesome already. Ah. Uh, but Mexico. Hey, hey, they don't have ice in Mexico. They don't have ice. Yeah, you're yeah. like, hey. So 
Long story short. Hey, Anderson, can you get me on the phone with the, Mex- the Mexican president? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get you there. Sweet. <laughs> Put me in, man. Yeah. So what had happened is uh, in order to do that, I had to become a Mexican citizen. So okay. I went and got my Mexican citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's no big deal. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. what happened? So I researched that, got my Mexican citizenship, and after that happened, uh, there was one other Mexican who was on the sports skeleton, and I met him because he would come here to train. Okay. Um, but uh, I said, you know, what's what's going on with the, you know, are you, are you going to be in the Olympics and this and that? He goes, you know, there's no funding for this. So it's all self-funded. And two, you know, they're, they're not crazy about the sports skeleton, right? Yeah. There, there's no excitement there. So I had to start sending letters to the Mexican Olympic Committee uh, asking if I could represent them in, 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 in the Trino Olympics. Yeah. Um, but I don't even speak Spanish, right? Yeah. So I had to have my mom write these letters. Your mom's writing the letters? Yeah. And uh, long story short, letter after letter after letter, you know, email after email after email, they simply never responded. And, and uh, you know, I think we tried calling and you get this press one, press two, we've left a couple of voicemails. Uh, long story short, they never replied, and I, you know, I tried, I mean, I figured I'd got my Mexican citizenship. I'm yeah. not going to give up. So Absolutely. I tried and tried and tried and trained and tried and trained and tried, and uh, they never contacted me, so I never was able to now, do it. in 2006, who represented Mexico in the skeleton? I don't think anybody. Not even that guy. Are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Hey, I'm still treating it as a sweet layer of this onion, too, man. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's cool. So maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool, man. Hey, I appreciate you doing this. Appreciate you. Let me get your story out. You know? Oh, my pleasure. That's Thank cool, you. Man. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been awesome. It's fun.